Sweet. Hi, friends. Uh, welcome to the .NET Doc Show. We're joined today by a special guest, uh, Damien Bowden, all the way from Switzerland. It is his evening, our morning here in the Central Time Zone. Um, and yeah, we're, we're super excited to have him on. I'm going to share some pictures real quick. Um, just to kind of draw the connections to how I know Damien. Damien and I first met um, first online at Twitter, but um, we've known each other for a while now through the developer community. And this is one event, uh, the MVP Summit, where we met each other. Uh, and then you can see over beers, yeah, celebratory bits. Much uh, love here for the developer community and other MVPs. So um, the reason we're excited to have Damien on, well, first of all, let me give some time here to Damien to do a quick introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Damien, Yo, and I love doing .NET Core, .NET development and David asked me to come on the show and so I'm delighted to take a chance and say hello to everyone. Awesome. Yeah, so the, the reason we were asking Damien to join us today is Damien's, uh, I would say, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, a bit unique in the sense that he's one of our kind of prolific external contributors and we are just thrilled to have that type of thing in our community from you know a, a development standpoint here uh in devrel we love it when external um people kind of give back to the community and go out of their way to do stuff so the screen i'm sharing here um is actually a new doc that damien proposed and worked with scott addy on and it's absolutely amazing so i'm just going to pass it over to you guys to kind of talk through this a bit and um, share some of the excitement. Okay. We might have lost Scott. They might have unpulled the plug, which is totally okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it from here. Um, but yeah, so this is a multi-factor authentication doc for ASP.NET Core. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty extensive read, in fact. It's 11 minutes to go through this. Um, but this covers a lot of bases here, and I was just thoroughly impressed by such a, a significant contribution from someone externally. So, Damien, uh, Damien I'd, I'd love to kind of pick your brain a bit about what it means to you to, like, give back and, like, how, how do you come up with this stuff? And, like, where, what's the driving factor? And what's the experience like uh, interacting with, you know, Microsoft? Well, well first, the reason, the reason I, I start with the docs and do it is because I'm... I use the docs the whole time for myself. So when I'm trying to learn or fix or solve problems for clients, um, the documentation is more or less my main source of information, plus Stack Overflow, of course. And then what I've noticed in the last while, I've, I've been doing a lot of security consulting and webs um, consulting for clients now. And sure. an awful lot of these questions come up with missing multi-factor authentication. How do I solve this with .NET? Where do I go for this? So that's how I came up with the idea of the docs because I've been doing this and I thought, oh, that would be something that would be useful for a lot of people. Maybe not for everyone, but for a lot of people. Yeah. So then I said, okay, this, this docs would be great to write. And then I suggested that maybe I could do it. So what I did is um, I did a couple of blogs myself to test it, to see what's happening. And then when I thought it was ready, fairly ready to make it maybe public, then I asked if I could add, add this to the Microsoft Docs, and then, of course, he agreed. And then it was a, a pretty big effort to get it into it. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm quite actually amazed with Scott, the amount of corrections and time he took to merge the, the work. Yeah, I ha yeah. nearly have a bad feeling because my pull request costs so much time for ye. But I'm uh, actually amazed tonight it comes in then after the end of the day. Like So it's, um, hopefully it's useful for people. And my motivation is more... It helps me learn and it helps me give back to the community as well. It's a bit of both. It's it's not just me giving to the community, but it's also a win for me because in me writing the docs, I actually learn if I understand the stuff. And then yeah. also I get feedback, no, that's incorrect, that's correct. And my knowledge gets better as well. So it's it's a win for me, it's a win for the public. And then it's I think it's it's really good fun doing it. Improves really the English. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always incredible how much English mistakes I make, and that's what I think with Scott. I'm just so grateful he he's amazing at correcting it. <laughs> Making yeah. it into a professional document is quite quite a difference. Well, that's and I awesome. would say I I make you know as a docs writer myself, I make a ton of mistakes. So 
um, you know, when it, it certainly helps when we have folks in the community like yourself contributing entire docs that we would never have time to get to. And I think it's really unique, too, because um, a, a bit of bias comes into play from our perspective where we have kind of, um, you know, this sense of things that we're supposed to deliver on versus things that are actually happening out in the real world. So I'm assuming that a lot of this stuff is stuff that you've mentioned before, Damien, that you've encountered, right? And this is yeah. the, the stuff that you're doing and you're, you know, with consulting with your enterprise companies and stuff like that. So this is some of the most valuable documentation to have. Yeah. yeah for, for us at the moment, we notice that just in this document here, we notice an awful lot of my clients are actually forcing the two-factor, multi-factor authentication now. So they need it in every application or every type of thing. They want a solution for this. And then they also have multiple users and a lot of applications for different tenants and so on. So it's nearly every single application we implement now, it's becoming a, a standard requirement now for anything web facing now anyway. Wow, that's awesome. So I'm going to put you on the spot for a bit. And <laughs> I want to ask you kind of a, a, a probing question. What do you think could be improved upon in this process? Like what, what are one of the potential blockers that are potentially, you know, prohibiting others from the, the community to contributing? Like what can we do to make that experience better? The, the experience I don't think can be improved too much is maybe more starter docs because that I think the hardest thing with documentation or contributing is your first PR. So if it's it's easier for the person doing the first PR and they they notice that people are friendly because what I notice in that when I'm doing um, committing to public uh, open source communities or public documentation or whatever, the hardest bit for me is that the very first commit and see how they react to that. If Sometimes you, you, you commit to an open source project and you notice that they don't, don't actually want it or they, they say, oh, more work for me, I don't want this. And then you say, okay, I'll stay away. And then with Microsoft documentation of the aspect on a core repository, you notice that people actually say, oh, thanks a million for this. And I know that it cost a lot of effort and time for you, but I don't feel that. And I think that's really great. So for me, what makes it easier is the very first PR that people don't be scared to try it. Don't be scared to do it. And once you do the first one and notice that it's it's really welcome and you, you, you like to have it, then they'll do another one and do another one then. So I think yeah. you're doing a great job. It's just, it's really, even if I make rubbish or you just say, look, we can't fit it in. It doesn't <laughs> it doesn't suit us. It's a polite no and it's, it's great. It's perfect. I, yeah. I think it's a really good system. But maybe the very first PR, a bit more okay this is the first PR from person x how hard was it to get it in and then make it more public it's really easy to, to make contributions so but so maybe like celebrate it more right like the first one it, it, if there is that sense of like fear or whatever celebrate the fact that someone's yeah. going out of their way to do it right because an awful lot of people have this experience is committing to an open source repository and then you get hacked down and say that's rubbish that's crap that doesn't suit that happens an awful lot in the open source community. So people to be a little bit scared by the very first commit in a lot of repositories or a lot of places. Interesting. But that doesn't happen here. I, I have noticed that myself. Um, for that reason, I personally try to be a little more welcoming to new <clears throat> contributors. I, I can't tell you how many open source repos I've contributed to in the past. And I do get that feeling that you've described where I, I don't feel welcomed. I feel like any contribution I make is you know, just more work for that team. Uh, we try to, to make our contributors feel appreciated. And one of the things we've done to sort of move in that direction and make that more apparent is we have these new what's new pages we've been publishing to our ASP.NET Core docs. One of the sections you may have noticed in each of those pages is a community contributors section at the very bottom. Uh, if you scroll through some of those latest pages, I'm sure you would find Damien's name somewhere in that list. And that's just a small token of our appreciation for the work that he's done for our team and for the community. Thanks. That's cool. That's awesome. Hey, guys, I've joined the chat. Hi, Cam. Hi, Cam. Cam does not get enough credit. He's our producer, orchestrator, 
amazingness, all the technical bits, everything. Well, in case, you know, if things do go wrong, it's all his fault, but otherwise we'll praise him. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so, so the uh, section I'm talking about there, David, while you're on that page, if you look over in the in this article uh, section on the far right, <laughs> you'll see community contributors listed there. And sure enough, there's Damien's uh, GitHub alias listed there. Um, cool. And so that's what the that's what like the number of contributions that he's made for that month. Yes, for that and, for that month. And that can be misleading. You know, one contribution might be more significant than the six that Kirk had made. Oh, uh, yeah. In yeah, this that's particular a... case, I, I would guess Damien's contribution probably was more significant. I would guess that was an entire doc that was submitted. I just had a really cool idea. So what if we were to improve that experience, right? So then when we call out community contributors, we actually weight like the number of lines or the number of commits and like the number of actual, you know, content that's being contributed and have some sort of like iconography that's tied into it. We could automate that because this is an automated doc anyways, right? Um, that's a really cool way to kind of give more credit and applause to the, the you know, the huge effort. Um, that was put into this. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Just, I like that idea. And to be clear, I'm not saying number of contributions tells the whole story. It certainly doesn't. Right, uh, right. But in this case, there is a significant difference here in, in terms of the contributions we're seeing. Damien is one of the the power contributors in our repo. But looking at this list here, that would not be evident. Yeah, right. So, I mean, like Kirk, for example, just, I mean, hypothetically, these six contributions could have just been typos, right? So six typos, easy, low-hanging fruit contributions versus potentially one uh, that is, you know, 11-minute read with, you know, back and forth, you know, uh, a slew of commits and all, all that stuff and interaction with Microsoft people. And yeah, so that's that's interesting. It's the same problem we have with the contribution graph on GitHub. Uh, some folks strive to keep that chart green um, every day of the week, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. You know, were you making that thing green by fixing small typos, or were those, you know, new libraries you were contributing on GitHub? You get the picture. Yeah. I do like your idea, though, David, of adding some kind of iconography there to that list to paint a better picture of what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. We, we can look into that more. Um, another thing that made me think of is like, you know, certain platforms will have like security bounties and that will encourage experts, right. Um, through monetary things to, to go, Hey, let's go try to probe this and, and fix potential security issues. What if we had that, um, um, some sort of like reward system for um, for docs contributing docs. Like, it, what if we were to take the time and say we have all these gaps and these are things that we don't potentially have time for, right? Um, and then open it up to the community and encourage them, almost like a bounty type system. Like, if you provide these docs and work with someone here, you know, you can get some sort of praise. Or, you know, I I know that before they had like those tokens, right? And those were pretty. Um, awesome to have. I, I think Scott, you had had some of those before you joined Microsoft, right? Like the yeah. Open let source. me um, let me see if I can reach up and grab one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, we used to what Dave is describing. We used to uh, send out swag, and I don't know if you can see this in my. It blurs camera. it out. It's like, ooh, this is yeah. this is inappropriate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> inappropriate or not, I think it's cool. It's a uh, .NET. <laughs> Foundation challenge coin. Just trust me, that's what this thing is. That's really uh, cool. <laughs> we used to send these out along with a care package. So I recall a, a, a time in the past where I, you know, got a, I think it was a bundle of popcorn, some seasoning to put on the popcorn, a challenge coin, and then a handwritten thank you note uh, from the docs team saying, thank you for contributing to asp.net core docs we really appreciate it um in exchange for all of your effort we're sending you this gift that's awesome yeah that that's really cool i think if i was the recipient of something like that i would have felt like rewarded for my contributions and i would feel more encouraged to do more 
I, so, you know, I wonder if there's not a potential for some kind of a gamification, like what they do on Learn, uh, where the you know you unlock achievements for the more learning uh, uh, exercises you go through. Yeah, definitely. I think that makes sense too. We Ga- could have like an, achievement, like an achievement structure, and we could recognize like the, the 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 major contributors each month or whatever. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, so, so getting back to like the original. Um, I- idea here was, you know, Damien explicitly mentioned the first commit is the hardest. So is that still enough to get someone to do that scary first step? I don't know. I don't know. Is it, rewards is not usually what gets you to do it, I think. It's it's more if you try to do it or you do an issue, say I wouldn't mind doing a PR or committing that they get treated well, then that's the, the biggest thing. That they feel welcome. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And feeling welcome is another reason why we have something like a code of conduct in place. We want to make sure that, you know, we aren't being attacked, others aren't being attacked in our repo. It just, we want to foster this environment of respect in our repo. Uh, If everyone respects each other, the system works very, very well. Um, If that respect doesn't exist, things fall apart in a hurry. And then also what helps as well, because we all make mistakes, when when you do make a mistake that you be you know, just nice to the people saying, look, it's, it doesn't, it's not really that good, maybe change this, instead of sometimes you say, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I think that's a really good thing. And I think that actually goes um, both ways too, right? Where um, sometimes as I've experienced this personally, um, and I feel inclined to share it, there's been times where uh, there's been like, mistakes in stuff and i've felt hesitant to say anything you know mm-hmm. i'll just say this is good let's get it in and then later on i'll go clean it up and yeah. that's the wrong approach too because that doesn't help the contributor either right so to your point constructive c- criticism but like an open dialogue about it and and just be very humble and accepting of everyone's perspectives and i think that's super valuable and i think constructive criticism is sometimes hard to hear um, you'd like to think that that first PR you sent that maybe you spent eight hours working on is, is good enough. But, you know, to David's point, if we just accepted the first iteration of a PR each and every time, we would then be setting the precedent that there's no quality bar. The reality is it's an open source project that's used widely in the enterprise. There has to be a quality bar somewhere. And we have to hold community contributors to the same standard as uh, the folks that actually work on the docs team. You'll notice the same thing in the ASP.NET Core uh, product repo. uh, That, you know, I could submit a new feature to the framework. And if that thing does not have unit tests, you best believe someone is going to say this needs unit tests before it's accepted. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a. Uh, I don't want to say shaming, but there, there's, there is a higher quality bar, I think, um, that, that gets attained when the work that you're doing is visible to other people, and you know it's visible, and you know they're going to be looking at it actively. It's like the. The, the, um, the I think the, I think the quality bar just automatically gets raised. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, I that just reminded me of a hackathon I worked on um, w- with some uh, some some of you kind folks actually um, in July. It was a Microsoft hosted one, and uh, Bill Wagner had this idea to scan all of the previous pull requests and issues and try to determine whether or not things could be automatically closed. Um, and one of the ideas that came out of that, like a peripheral aspect, was um, using the um, uh, using the um, sentiment analysis and whatnot, and you know, machine learning and trying to analyze all, all these different aspects of it. But another thing was. Uh, we had came up with a profanity filter. So if anyone comes into a repo, right, since it's open source and anyone can do it, 
a lot of times people will express their frustration through <laughs> through curse words, right? And uh, you know they're not necessarily wrong to be upset for whatever their you know reasons are, um, but you know we had this GitHub action that would fire off when there's new pull requests or issues, and if there was profanity that was found, we could automatically replace those. Um, with like emoji of like you know unicorns and smiley faces and uh, stuff like that that made it a lot more approachable, right? So you weren't necessarily as um, you know frustrated. I have one question while I've got you all on. Um, do you know how you have the different versions of .NET and the docs do support all the different versions? Come September, you'll have another version. How, how do you plan to? <laughs> have one doc covering all the different docs it's just starting to get tricky now no yeah it is um a tricky I, I would say is an understatement so uh <laughs> actually next <laughs> next week that's a, an item for me to look into um we're actually going to have to revisit our versioning strategy that we're currently using uh, so the way that it works right now, which Damien's probably aware of, is we have inline monikers with version numbers attached to them that we use inside of the markdown files. So let's say we have a doc where the behavior <coughs> changed in version 3.1, but it was the same before that. We might have two pairs of yeah. monikers yeah. Um, to handle that. They're allowed and, to join. They can say hi. And my kids are informing me they found a duck. Oh, um, that's cool. <laughs> Ducks are way better than uh, version monikers and markdown files, man. Yeah, they thought I said duck, but it was doc. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's amazing. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's different version monikers that we use in the, the markdown files to kind of determine which section to render when a user selects that. So, yeah. Interesting. So anyways, what I was trying to say is we're shifting from that approach now to something a bit more robust. And what we're thinking about doing at this point is maintaining a copy of each doc per major version. And so what that would mean for the 3.x releases, 3.0 and 3.1 would be we'd have one doc that would represent those two versions and then a copy of that doc that would represent the 5.x releases if that made any sense oh um, so that that means more docs it does so the unfortunate uh thing there is it results in duplication of content across files so we're weighing the pros and cons of that particular approach um, at this point we're sort of at the mercy of what the versioning system has to offer at this point in time wow interesting so what would happen if when do you say you no longer update the docs for old versions? That's another thing we're looking at. So an idea that's been tossed around is maybe we only keep the LTS versions and later up to date. So 2.1 and later in this case. Mm -hmm. It's all being discussed internally and nothing is set in stone at this point. But it is a, a major problem we need to sort out in the very near future. You know, the five zero is not so far away. <laughs> yeah, it's coming up quick. It's crazy too. So, w what does that actually mean? So, there, there's might be some viewers on here that are kind of curious. Like, what is this .NET five you're speaking of? One framework to solve them all. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny that remember the old days, the very first versions of ASP.NET Core came out. It was called ASP.NET Core five or ASP.NET five. I remember that. Yeah, I, I was one of the first people to write about that on my personal blog. Um, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, they, they rebranded it to core. And I was like, huh. So now to see .NET 5 again, almost, right? It's kind of like this weird unification. Um, so does, do you guys know what that means to, for .NET standard? Um, .NET standard's getting revved. Uh, .NET Standard is, is still .NET Standard, but it's just adding a, a revision, isn't it? I mean, I could be wrong. I didn't know if if .NET uh, 5 was going to be like a, a platform then, uh, that .NET Standard then, because you, they got that map where it says, you know, if you're on this version of .NET Standard, you can use that library against this kind of like runtime, right? 
So is that going to be the same type of thing when .NET 5 comes out? That's, that's a great question. We should investigate that. Imo is writing lots of blogs in that team now at the moment. He's yeah, I was just going to suggest Emo's name. Uh, Emo Landworth, um, who's pretty active on Twitter, would probably be the best person to address that. I've heard bits and pieces, but I'm not sure what there I can share publicly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was kind of prying at. I figured you guys would have more insider information than me, um, which is awesome. And I don't know if people saw this or not, but... Um, I'm going to actually be joining the .NET Docs team. So I'm super excited by that. It's just a recent thing here. So um, I'm going to be sad, though. Bitter, bittersweet moment. I'm leaving the Cognitive Services team, but excited to yeah, join but, .NET. Yeah, but we're getting we're getting an awesome content developer. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time feeling sad about that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question, and I I, I felt almost like a, a sense of humor there, Damien, when you said, "What are you guys going to do about .NET five, Right? You kind of put like this elephant in the room, and um, it's interesting because it is going to really change a lot of things. Uh, so that means .NET Core is going away, right? I mean, as a as a term, <laughs> I mean as a, <laughs> as a branding uh, as a branding term, sure. So for me personally, I think of this as uh, the new major version of .NET Core. It's really a convergence of .NET frameworks. That's the best way to think of it. So goes the next element. What happens to Entity Framework? Does that go back to Entity Framework 7 or to Entity Framework 4 or 5? Uh, great, yeah, great question. So, so let me break it down like this. So think of the next major release of .NET Core will be .NET 5. No core in the name. The next major release of ASP.NET Core will be ASP.NET Core 5. The same thing with EF Core. The next major version is EF Core 5. Okay. Yeah. So it's confusing, though, because you would think, okay, .NET Core 5, because ASP.NET and EF are keeping the core uh, name in the branding. But that's not the case. Okay, but then, but then in 2021... <laughs> when dot when dot net six comes out, then we're going to have EF Core six, along with EF six. That is, <laughs> yeah, we're going to need more tables and maps of things, right? I think it's the naming and versioning things. That's that's you know some of the most difficult things in programming. So these are the things that keep me awake at night, trying to figure out. <laughs> How do you address things like this in docs? It's more challenging than you might think. Uh, just yesterday, we were having a conversation about breaking changes in .NET. So if a customer is migrating from .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 5, um, how do you make that less confusing to them that they're migrating to a newer version of essentially the same framework, but the name of the framework has changed? Yeah, that's interesting. And, uh, and that just, what's that? It's much easier than going from .NET 4, 7 to 5 as it is going for .NET 3 to 5. Is, .NET 3 core is much easier going to 5 as .NET 4, 7. Oh, okay. And that that's actually it's interesting you bring that up because I was just going to ask that question. Like, uh, I was assuming that .NET 5 was going to be like this convergence of both the framework and the core parallels where they're finally catching up with the framework bits and having enough API exposure that it would be an easier transition over to five. But I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, on, honestly, honestly, I mean, the, the first preview came out, what, like... Um, last week, I believe. Yeah, a week yeah. ago, right? I haven't gotten my hands on it yet, but um, I... I I'd love to know. I mean, I, I haven't touched .NET Framework for oh gosh, a couple of years. Everything I've done has been in .NET Core. So yeah, I'd be too. interested. Yeah, I'd be interested in having like a .NET Framework project and bringing that into the .NET Core world. Like, like I, I don't have any projects laying around that I could try that on, but I, I'd like to go through that process and, and see what it's like because I'm I'm dying to see what that convergence looks like. Yeah, yeah. and I would say with Preview One. It's very early days. One of the things you're going to notice in Preview 1 is the target framework moniker 
for .NET 5 still includes the word core in it. It's .NET Core App 5.0. <laughs> that target framework moniker, or what I'm going to abbreviate to TFM, will change in a later preview uh, so that it does not include the word core. So what would the TFM be? It would be just .NET 5? Uh, I'd have to look it up. I have it somewhere in my inbox. Uh, for sure, it won't include the word core. Uh, I thought it was always interesting, too, that they would add app to the, the TFMs. I, I didn't know if it was necessary. Right, like net core app. Why not just net core and then the rev number? Well, yeah, I mean... I had a similar unless, thought. Well, unless, unless it's just the... Well, I, I'm, I'm reaching, but uh, unless it's like a, like a platform topics versus concept... Nah, I don't know. I'm reaching. Never mind. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm not nearly as familiar with Damien's uh, other external contributions. I just wanted to pick out this one. But out of curiosity, how many how many other contributions have you made, Damien? Do you have do you do you know offhand? No, I, just, I, don't, I don't look really. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you've been an MVP now for three years, right? <coughs> yep. Um, how would you, with the world being in this uh, pandemic, how would you rate your experience um, at, uh, of attending like the virtual summit? I know the uh, there's a lot to be you know kind of uh, you know, miss out on, right? You know, like the hallway track and the social hours, and a lot of times that's the stuff I would look forward to, right? Is interacting with you at those. Um, so, did you get a lot of valuable things from uh, at least the online sessions from the MVP summit? And I know again, there's certain things that are. NDA, so we can't share that. But well, and and before you before you answer that, Damien, I'd also be interested. I think maybe we should level set for for our viewers. Um, you know, we're about halfway through the stream here, and and just anybody who's joining us late, we've got Damien uh, Bowden with us, um, who is a, a a frequent Docs contributor and MVP. Damien, before you answer that question about the MVP summit, uh, just in case we've got any viewers or or after the stream who view the recording who don't know what an MVP is, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what that is? Um, it's yeah, well, yeah, it's actually, I don't know what it's just Microsoft recognizes you for adding contributions or helping out the community, and it doesn't have to be Microsoft projects, anything open source, or anything that helps the community shares your knowledge from your free time. Usually, not everyone does a free time, but a lot of it's free time, most of it. And when you give back to the community, or you help open source development or you help people with docs or you help them with projects or you do contributions to Microsoft is always a good one or you do talks um, Microsoft then type of recognize you as a someone that's really valuable to the community and really helps people learn and it's about a recognition for what you've done in the past tense it means you nothing about what you do in the future is, 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 there, is there any discount or anything that comes with that? Oh, there's loads of things that the network is amazing. The people you meet, the that's I've met so many amazing people, and the the M four P summits are amazing. That's you learn so much there. That's one of the best things. It's just such a great place to learn, and then also to meet people. And that, I think that, everyone's really open. That's really one of the nice things. You can talk to anyone there and ask them any question you want, and everyone helps you really much. So I did, from that that's week, a, that's a, I, mean, I learned so much. That, Sorry, I didn't mean to sort of step on you there. No, that's that's a that's a great point. And you know, I I what well, I was never an MVP. I I, I came to Microsoft, um, you know, just you know, like like uh, a regular person. But um, Dave and, and Scott were both MVPs before uh, before coming to Microsoft. Um, and that that what you said is that the networking. Um, I actually went to the MVP summit last year, the year before. And, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences, but that MVP summit was kind of just like the next level because it, it was it wasn't just people interested in topics and discussions, you know, and, and, you know, what Microsoft had to say about, you know, what's coming next. It was influencers and watching that networking go on among the among industry influencers was really a lot of fun. Um, and, and yeah, you were you were talking, you know, I, I stepped all over the conversation between you and Dave, <laughs> but I, I would like to hear. How was that different this year? Did, did, was was it was it like you know did did, did was it still the MVP summit? I guess is what I'm trying to say. But the what Microsoft organized and everything was amazing in such a short space of time. Yeah, that has really hands off and it's amazing. It's the content I thought was really good. I, I learned loads again. 
But you did miss the networking and you did miss meeting people. You did miss and socialising and that's, but that's obvious. There's nothing you can do about it. No, no one's responsible for that. The, that's It's a pity, but that's the way life is. But the, the sessions and the talks and what they organised and everything, I thought that was fantastic. It was a really great job. Cool, cool. I think that's an unfortunate consequence of the, the t- you know, what we're dealing with right now with the pandemic. For me personally, yeah. when I go to an event, say the MVP Summit in person, the most valuable thing for me there is the hallway track. Interacting with people you know or haven't seen in a while, you know, or people who you've never met, just discussing certain things with them outside of the formal sessions that are going on. That's where I extract the most value personally. And that's also where I found to that to me that was the most valuable part of being in the MVP program those interactions with people that you couldn't just, you couldn't turn your chair and talk to those people during the day because they're physically located all throughout the world, potentially thousands of miles from where you live. Well, even our internal conference slash training slash whatever you want to call it in, in docs, once a year we have a, for viewers, we have a, a boot camp where we get, um, all of the docs organization, which is, I don't know, probably about 50% on site in Red- Redmond and the other 50% spread out all over the world. Um, we, we get that entire organization in, um, in the Puget Sound area for some training and um, uh, other conference type activities. Uh, and uh, that, that's you know, kind of the same kind of this exactly the same kind of benefit, but even one step above, right? It, it's because these are people that you're working with. These are people that you have to have a relationship with day to day. But if the only relationship you ever have with them is through teams, how effective is that relationship going to be? I agree hundred percent. I recall uh, at my last MVP summit um, at the time I was working on a visual studio extension, collaborating with Mads Christensen and I ran into him in one of the sessions there, and that turned into us having a, you know, ad hoc design session in the hallway of, you know, hey, I think it should work this way. Um, and I, I would ask, Mads, do you agree with that? Long story short, we ended up agreeing, and based on that conversation we had in person, I was able to hack on the extension on the flight home and, and make it work. That's awesome. Uh, one of the hard things in M4P summit is the jet lag. That's 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 killers. It'd be about a week dead after it. Had to readjust. Oh. Yeah, how how long is the flight from Switzerland? It's it takes about twenty hours from door to door, but the oh. flight itself is it's eight hours. The one from Frankfurt to um, Seattle, and then I have to fly up to Frankfurt, and you have to wait there for a while in the airports and so on. And then, of course, you're, you're eight hours early. Or you're, you're, you have to stay up then until night time. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a very long day the first day. But you're energized to be there. Like the, the yeah. I think the trip going to it, you're more like pumped up. And But yeah. when you get back home, right, it's like, oh, just exhausted. Yeah. And usually you, you try and spend as much time as possible in America to try and see a bit of it. And then you get back, and then the next day you're back to work with the the eight hour shift and the ten hour shift. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, that was it's water. It's great. Yeah. So I have another docs question as well. Um, yeah. For me, the structure of the docs is really great. Um, I can really find my stuff really fast. I know where to look if I need to find the razor page or blazer stuff. I know exactly where to look. How how do you keep that good, or how do you manage that? That someone new with .NET Core, um, I asked me .NET Core, the docs have to work for them. For someone with loads of experience, the docs have to work. So how do you keep the quality of the structure that, because some docs I see, um, there's too much in it and then you can't find what you're looking for. And I think the ASP on the core docs have found a nice mixture that I can, I find it really easy to navigate and find the stuff around it quickly. And I assume new people as well. But how do you keep the quality high there? Because that's not an easy thing. How no, many, not so many sections. Not easy by any means. So 
uh, one thing we do or we've started doing very recently is we're in close communication with the product team. Um, we have a biweekly meeting with uh, one of the engineering managers on the ASP.NET Core product team. And these are the kinds of things we talk about. You know, for this particular doc, say it's the configuration doc, um, how do you make that approachable or understandable to someone who is brand new to ASP.NET? But how do you also make that useful to a seasoned ASP.NET Core developer? Um, those are the types of things we talk about. One of the other things we're tackling right now, another teammate of mine, uh, Wade Pickett, is uh, redesigning our hub page uh, for ASP.NET, uh, which will make it easier for beginners to find things. Um, one of our goals with that hub page redesign is, is to cater more towards that beginner. Know, we want new developers to start using ASP.NET Core, but we've realized that that hub page as it exists today is really doing us a disservice in accomplishing that goal. So it's it's challenging because, as you said, the docs need to be valuable to multiple audiences. And unfortunately, there's no what I'll call a persona selector in the docs. You know, are you... Uh, a complete novice, or have you been doing this for you know ten plus years? Uh, we have no selector that allows you to drill down like that. That's a really interesting perspective, though. Uh, that that that's made me think. Like there is uh, on the docs.microsoft.com site, there is this sense of like an identity, right? We you have the option to sign in. Um, could we add some of those bits to a user's profile that might help even drive this? Uh, more, right? Where if I said, I'm a C-sharp developer, I'm a .NET developer, I like TypeScript, don't ever show me Java docs, right? <clears throat> Stuff like that. Could that help kind of, we could use that profile almost to help kind of cater the content a bit. And and I'm thinking from the lens of like, you know, I, I've been writing for Azure um, and their doc set is immensely larger than any other doc set in the, the organization. Um, and it's something like that might be a, you know pretty pretty helpful because there's you know there's different flavors of CLIs there's different flavors of you know programming languages and preferences for platforms and operating systems and so on and so forth so if if you were to create a profile it, it might even help kind of um, you know we could build some functionality into the platform that that could be cool but yeah it's yeah sorry it's it's a Really interesting idea. So the profile in docs that David is describing is a fairly new thing. I would say that's been in existence for maybe six months. But now we can start to talk about things like what David is talking about here. Uh, one use case I can think of is when you come to the ASP.NET Core docs today, you're going to see a version selector in the top left corner of the page. That version selector is going to default to the latest stable uh, release which today is uh, ASP.NET Core 3.1. But what if you know that when you come to Docs, you always want it to default to ASP.NET Core 2.1, which is our other LTS release, because your organization is unlikely to upgrade to 3.1 anytime soon. I see that being a game changer if we could allow the, the reader to set a default like that in their profile. Yeah, that'd be amazing. These are great language. ideas. Yeah, language. Yeah, programming language. Oh, or are you saying like locale? Like locale. Uh, that's awful here. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, that always comes in the wrong language for me. That's interesting. Um, we should French, we should uh, we should chat offline about that because I want to make sure that gets addressed if that's uh, been causing you issues. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I have an English browser installed now. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah I, i'm actually taking notes because there's been lots of little things here from this conversation damien that we we greatly appreciate and uh i want to make sure gets improved upon um awesome okay and switzerland's a little bit special because we have the four national languages but everyone programming uses english or almost everyone so if you're if you're working professionally you want to have everything in english but if you're a user, you want it in your local language. And I live in Bern, which means that um, I get half, it sometimes comes in the French language, and the other half comes in German. 
So it wow. depends which which part of the geolocation picks up. Interesting. <laughs> so so do you just like keep a browser that's like manually forced to one uh, one culture? No, no, I, I I have everything like German is my work computer, but if when I'm doing um I'd say software programming, then everything's in English. I'll have the whole computer in English for programming with the actual client, one of them. That, wow. that, raises, that raises a really interesting point. And I, I, I've always wondered this as, you know, as a member of like Generation X, I don't, you know, um, I, 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 I grew up with computers and, and like a lot of the <coughs> programming languages and paradigms that we work with ha, are, have always been at least English centric, if not American centric. And and I wonder what that experience is like elsewhere in the world. I mean, I, I as just an as just an American, I, I realize that I kind of live in a bit of an ivory kind of a gilded palace, right? Because I can I can be like, oh yeah, everything's in my language. Uh, <laughs> all the documentation is in my language. All the all the uh, you know default output settings, everything for that is configured for EN US. But how? Tell me how. What what is it? It's probably far more common than I would I would be comfortable with. It, how frequently are you out there and you're like, okay, I'm trying to, I'm I'm thinking right now in in, in German. I am in German mode, and oh crap, this document is in English. Okay, I'm just gonna have to run with it. Does that does that like throw off your workflow? Does that like? Nah, because you get used to it. The, it's depends what the if I'm working in English, is everything's in English. If I'm doing it in German, then everything's in German, and it, it depends. What's the language in the meeting? Because that changes. It depends. On one team you speak German, the next team you speak English, and then you keep following with that type of culture. Then, so the hardest thing is when it, when I go to Germany walking because the Excel just get totally confused then because in Germany they use the commas instead of the dots for the numbers. So you, you don't open up an Excel from Germany in Switzerland like it's, it's just a mess because we have the English format with the dot as the the comma. Or the, how to say, the decimal point. And right, right. Comma for the decimal points and stuff like that gets really confusing then. But I, I would imagine, yeah. So, yeah, this is this all relates to the localization of the docs. It <clears throat> depends on the doc set you're looking at. Some doc sets that we have support, I think, 13 different locales. Uh, some support, I want to say, up to 16. But the interesting thing there is a lot of those docs are machine translated. Some of the higher traffic docs are actually translated by hand. So you're going to notice a significant difference in quality there. I can think of a case where Cam and I were working on a Microsoft Learn module for ASP.NET Core. And I want to say it was Spanish where we were listing the startup.cs file. We were talking about that in an ASP.NET Core project. That doc was machine translated, and it uh, it converted startup.cs to startup.js, which is <laughs> a huge almost mistake. Same. Yeah, almost, almost the same. <laughs> yeah, we had we had actually we we, we had a couple of uh, uh, complaints about it from from Spanish speaking users who, who were like um, can't find the file here, guys. It's broken. Yeah, not our not our fault. So we recognize there is opportunity for improvement in that area. The problem is um, it is very expensive to do any kind of localization of docs, which is why machine translation is even a thing. I wonder if that's like an opportunity too for community contributions, right? Like say, here's this doc that's written this way. Uh, we are looking for the locale you know and throw it out there just leave it open and say what anyone wants to contribute uh, taking this doc translating it into uh, another language i think you have that program going no well i don't the, i don't know i'm not oh. sure so we do, do have do you know the something? we do have i think for asp.net core 13 distinct uh localized versions of the ENUS repo, you can certainly go to those repos and, you know, contribute fixes that you think need to be made in other languages. But unless there's an army of people doing that, does that really scale? Yeah, that's a good question. 
And anyway, if you do the 80 20% rule, most people programming use English as their tool language, even if they're speaking a lot of language. It depends what country and what culture you have. But what I know is we, we speak German or French or Italian here mostly in Switzerland, but most people program together in English. But then you speak the, the language wherever you are. So yeah, that, docs, that actually, you want English docs because you're doing the work in English. That, that, actually, that actually reminds me of a joke. So what do you, what do you call someone who speaks two languages? Go on. Bilingual. Bilingual, Bilingual. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Trilingual. <laughs> okay. What do you call someone who speaks one language? I don't know. American. American. <laughs> <laughs> well, they speak Spanish as well, no? Uh, in parts of the country, yeah. See, <laughs> see. Si, si. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, well, we're getting close to our time here. Let's let's uh, see if we have any you know closing thoughts. Um, any any other questions that you have, Damien, or any other initial feedback you want to share? No, no. Just I think you're doing a great job, and um, I think it's excellent, and it's really nice, and it's really great to work with you, and. It makes yeah, it really uh, easy to help and feel useful, even though I know it costs cost loads of time. <laughs> no, 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 no. You actually uh, saved me a significant amount of time because uh, the docs you're contributing become things that I no longer have to worry about writing. Uh, you know, the little bit of time I spend working with you on your PRs, it pays off. It really does. To write a doc like that multi-factor auth doc that you recently submitted, you know, it may have taken me a couple of weeks to, to crank that out myself. And that's a couple of weeks that I can't afford to spend right now because there's higher priority docs that need to get out there. Like the, the 5.0 migration doc that was just released, for example. Yeah, that's Thanks. awesome. Yeah, we're, we're super humbled. Oh, I, I can't speak for Cam and Scott, but I am super humbled by all of the external contributors and I've learned so much from others that way. And I, I can say that I'm immensely grateful for it. So we're, we're excited and hoping that the, the external contributions continue. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to chime in too. And the, the, most of the docs that I've been working on um, since, since being in the .NET docs haven't even had um a whole lot of public contribution options open. They've all been like Azure API reference type stuff. But um, I, I want to take this opportunity to just mention, I just moved all of the Azure on .NET documentation into the .NET docs repo. So anybody who, uh, any .NET folks who you're, you're, you're like, hey, I, I have like this end-to-end -end, uh, thing that I've done in Azure, and you want to write up like a tutorial or something on it, hit me up. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Well, it's been great having you on today, Damien. As always, um, good luck in your future external contributions. Stay healthy and you too. take care. Yep. Look forward to seeing you all next year. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> cool. See you next time on the Thanks, Thanks yep. again, Thanks, Damien. Yep. Thank you take care. as well. Yep. Bye.